not get close to this guy. Hi everyone, this is Elliot Jacobson here. I am so excited. This is our my very first live to YouTube with that I have done in a long time, and I have an incredibly special guest with me. This man right here. This is Sam Mitchell wow. in the flesh. This, this is Sam Mitchell of Collapse Chronicles. He's sitting right there and we are drinking margaritas and we are just going to just have a little bit of a doom fest right now together uh, and uh, just have a good time, right? Just talk about uh, good time in the doomosphere. It's always a good time in the doomosphere. Uh, there's never a better time than <laughs> now. Than right now. <laughs> to drink a margarita. And what I like about this, can you see that this margarita is green? Because I have a green screen back there, so naturally there is a, what is that, a coal mine? I have a little bit of a coal mine in copper my mine. Mine. copper mine in my margarita. Because so what we I'm want to do is... I, I don't, I've cash. chose the copper mine for, so if you come here, for all the you people know. cheering on the uh, what I'm doing. bright green lies of the energy transition. You understand that over the next third to do this for the transmission lines, we're going to need three times as many of those on the planet. Right, mine says it's bring all of those green clean. Where else on the planet are we going to get lithium and cobalt from and copper? I mean, we need a lot of money just like that to save planets, Exactly. We need holes like that, and not only do we need holes like that, we need wind turbines. I have to let solar. We need to cover the desert by solar panels. Well, well, that's how the and my email the spills lines to get that it part of yeah. the screen. You know, yeah. spread out all over spread the place. Spread out. So we are more so halls in no, the No, I'm fine. Holes I have my cell phone with me now. That's that's I just our can't keep my that is our, our bright green so future. We are so excited my email today. Today. That we're going to have a bright green future. I can't even yeah. for a second. Any rate, email. that's not really what we're talking about. So my pale green future. Our our pale green truth right here, right? This is our pale green truth. Um. So hey, we are here live today and what we thought we would do i mean we could talk about doom ourselves but we would we just did that two days ago we we are here sam is visiting me from syracuse ithaca new york, ithaca, new york where it is six degrees yeah. and eight here, inches of snow on the ground and here in california it's 70 or you know <laughs> 22 if you are a celsius fan over there uh, oh, look, we have uh, Ian Dillon says it's 11 p.m. in Ireland. Hi there. Oh, Hi, Ian. How are you? I thought it was like 3 o'clock in the morning in Ireland, so I'm glad it's uh, okay. Uh, thank you for joining us, Ian. By the way, Ian Dillon, uh, yes. collapse aphorisms. I'm sorry for doxing you a la Elon Musk right there. <laughs> But Ian, Ian Dillon is the one who motivated me to write the essay, Choking on Hope. What, yeah. is, what, is, what was the title of that essay again? Choking on. Choking on. Choking on. Anyway, I'm, I'm trying to get the new T-shirt, Choking on Hope. I think I think uh, Ian has come up with a great new doomerism. Choking on hope. So, if, if you could explain, describe this, uh, the the bright green lies. Yeah. <laughs> Choking so, on hope. Hope. So, so thank you, Ian, for one of the all-time greatest uh, uh, suggestions. Look, we have people from England. Uh, that's great. Um, yeah. <laughs> all right. So, uh, anyway, yeah. So we are just going to be answering your questions. Hopefully, uh, you know, I I have this all set up. I'm sorry for having the the crash of the other channel. So what happened here is that I am running software that I have not used in a year. I haven't done a live broadcast and uh, I guess they upgraded the software and I had to do different youtube -y things than I had to before. So sorry about the crash. Thank you for finding us again. I, I appreciate you doing that. Um, so let me just see if there's a question up here. The The first question that I saw... We already um, have that many comments in the yeah, chat Yeah, we already have that many question, uh, comments, right? Uh, so so uh, here it is. Tennessee Jed is asking uh, the only question that really matters is how fucked are we? So, so 
on a let, let's put this on a on a I don't know one to ten scale. Uh, uh, how fucked are we, Sam? We, we are completely fucked. Uh-huh. I, I, uh, I, if anybody has not seen the uh, the mockumentary, it's just two minutes. Look, uh, just plug it on YouTube. It's David Attenborough's Fucked Planet. It, it is uh, two of the funniest minutes in YouTube history uh, where he goes through and David Attenborough, in a, in a rare moment of honesty, explains to people, uh, we're, we're, we're completely, totally fucked. I mean, it's not just humans. He goes, you know, there's, uh, I think the flamingos are fucked, the penguins are fucked, the elephants are fucked, the whales are fucked, you know. Anyway, we're fucked. It, it, there's... So it's not, it's not really, there's not really a scale, you know. When somebody asks that question, you know, it, it's, it's like, how dead are, how dead is something Yeah, yeah how, dead, how right? dead are we? Uh, right, I mean, uh, there, there's like, like, you know... <laughs> It's like there's not a level of uh, of being dead, right? You're not like kind of dead or a lot dead, you know. We're not on the way. Well, well, okay, we are completely fucked, but we are on the way to even being more fucked than completely fucked. Is there such thing of I, I, of being one hundred and ten percent fucked? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. If we're one hundred percent fucked today, we're going to be one hundred and one percent fucked tomorrow. So, so here's a, here's an actual question. That oh, okay. This is uh, we were asked. This is a real question, uh, right? That we're gonna have to put question. on our intellectual. Right. And you, I have to be serious. And you know all of this stuff. Yeah. Do you or me? Do we believe that there is any ge- geoengineering project like uh, Mir or Cloud Color Change? Are there any uh, geoengineering projects? Let Let's assume a perfect world where yeah. every country all mm-hmm. around the planet okay. suddenly cooperates. Right where we suddenly have trillions of extra dollars, okay. where we suddenly have the cooperation of wherever the the people all are. All these where, ain't going to happen. Assumptions. All these ain't yes. things. So, ain't so if there is if there is some <laughs> miracle by which we could get a geoengineering thing off the ground, do you think it would make a difference? At at this point, m- my response is cane toads. If if you're not familiar with the story of cane toads. Uh, every single time science has tried to, 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 to solve, it, solve one problem with, 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 well, that would be bioengineering in the case of cane toads. It's a great documentary. It, it just makes the problem worse. Uh, the, the unintended consequences, the unknown unknowns of geo, and then they're even known unknowns. Uh, it's frying pan or the fire guys. It, 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 the best geoengineering is going to do is take us out of the frying pan for about 10 minutes and put us over here in the fire. There, there's so many frying pan versus the fire contradictions. This is one of them. Yeah, so and I, I, the- I'm just thinking that, you know, you talk about mirror and from a, a purely engineering mm-hmm. perspective, right, the mirror reflection project, it's probably the only one that has true legs. Yeah, we could we could spray sulfates over the Arctic, and if we are willing to commit, I forget what it is, seven hundred uh, in just uh, you know army grade refueling jets to twenty four seven spraying sulfates, you know, to help cool down the Arctic. And the moment we stop doing that, yeah, we're going to get a yeah. superheating event. You know, we could do that, with, but the mirror reflection project in an ideal, perfect world where everybody cooperates and we don't mind covering a huge you know area <laughs> of the ocean with with the, these mirrors. Um, yeah, I mean that that has you know you know, or we could do one of these sails out in outer space, you know, that reflects back. Look at look at what I've done to him. Look now there, look what you did to this guy already, right here. We're two minutes into it. I know he was crying into his hands right there. All right, this one's from Oscar Roberts. Oscar says, "What do you see as the ethical considerations of telling people the actual situation? They're now happy, productive, loving, and content people." And because we are telling them about collapse view, we are ruining their happiness and their life. So let me answer that one first. I got an answer for that one. So this is the famous Plato in the cave, right? So we have people staring at the shadows in the cave. uh, and, And is the person better off in their life by not knowing 
that there's really a whole world out there and they're just looking at the shadows that are being reflected by a candlelight onto the back, right? This is the matrix, right? The red pill versus the blue pill. Which one do you want, right? This is, this is um, a, an archetypal question of whether it is better to be dumb and happy or informed and, and live a tragic, knowledgeable life, right? And I think nobody can answer that question because the people in the cave didn't believe the person who had gone out, right? And the people who, you know, the red pill, blue pill, the, the people who are in the matrix love the matrix. You don't want to, they didn't want to know, right? So I think everybody is individually going to choose that. I don't think just because somebody talks about this stuff, they are forcing somebody, you know, I'm, neither one of us is forcing this truth on anybody. We're not, we're not out there saying you must, you know, this is a, a necessary truth. We are simply providing uh, a different outlet for information that's already accessible should people choose to go after it. It's not like I, this is just somebody inventing this stuff. We're just, we are just, uh, well, you more than me, being journalists, right? This is just journalism at its core. Any, th any other thoughts about my, that? My, my answer I've made clear since day one, since coming down here in this, uh, into the Doomosphere 14 years ago, I, I would not wish this on my worst enemy. Uh, if you are just coming down here, just sticking your little toe to test the waters here, get the hell out of here, run as fast as you want. It has never been my, I have no interest in convincing somebody who, who doesn't understand how fucked we are uh, that we're fucked. It, it, it is nowhere in my brain. I am talking to the people who understand we are fucked, understand this is the biggest story in the history of humanity, bar none, and who just happen to be interested in the subject and, and want to meet a, a group of like-minded people who are willing to handle the truth with a capital T. I, I have no interest in converting anybody, any clueless more on this planet to being a doomer on any level. Never, I've never claimed that. There's no, no intention of, of that. So I, I have a true confession. I, I use the phrase clueless moron one time on Twitter. I, I, one single <laughs> time I said clueless moron in a tweet. And it was about five minutes before someone said, did, did you get that from Sam Mitchell? <laughs> and I just want to confess right now to plagiarizing this man. There you go. This moron uh, uh, statement. I am jealous of, uh, I wish I, uh, I was just talking, I was just talking to Sandy uh, on the phone a couple of days just ago. Just tell him who Sandy is. Uh, Sandy Shell is from Environmental Coffee House. She had just come back from a night at the ballet and she was going, Sam, and she goes, I wish I could just, still be a clueless moron that I could go to the fucking ballet, sit there and enjoy a, a beautiful dance without thinking about all the clueless morons throwing their plastic champagne cups into the garbage. Yeah. But, but it's once you go down yeah. here, it's like, you know, every time I take a walk in the I wilderness, so. I, you know, I'm, I, it's no matter what we try to do, once you go down here, and once you've red pilled, you can't you can't go back. And it does, you know what? what exactly what Sandy was talking about. It makes it a, a lot harder just to go enjoy a ballet on a Saturday night without uh, being uh, affected by the clueless well, morons well, throwing you, away their plastic champagne cups. Do they depress you? What do they? I mean, what's the? What, do they anger you? Does the hypocrisy? Does the ignorance? I mean, what is it that that? I mean, for me, I look at that with kind of like okay. That's just how the world is, right? And and I mean, there's there's you just do not meet many people out there who you just run into, and they're like, oh, tell me all about collapse. Oh, I never thought about that. You know, oh, what a what I'm so glad I met you, and you're going to talk. Yeah, you know, yeah. we, I mean, we, you know, it's not like 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 my career in gambling, right? If somebody knows I'm an expert in the casino industry, and they're like, oh, I like to gamble. Let's talk gambling, right? And I run into that all the time. People want to talk about how they know how to beat blackjack, and and you know they have some way, but but anytime you bring this topic up, right? You know, like you say at the ballet, you look, you cannot talk about this to anyone. <laughs> So people have to come to you, right? You can't yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, this is for people uh, who are coming into this knowledge and and or, and understand that this is the biggest uh, story in the history of humanity, 
And if you're interested, and possibly in the history, as the biggest story in the history of the planet since an asteroid. Yes, yeah, this is the biggest story in 66 million, 66 million years. years. Yes, yeah. what's going on outside uh, uh, of our window? It, it, this is the biggest story in 66 million years. Yeah, it's a lot bigger than Britney Spears eating cake off of her kitchen floor. That's what she did. Yeah, but, but I yeah. guarantee you. A lot more people on this planet know that Britney Spears was eating a piece of cake off the floor than understand that uh, we're fucked. Yeah, <laughs> well, well, by factors of But thousands. I already forgot what the question was. That doesn't matter. I'm going to go answer? on. Let's go on to another question. Okay, isn't there hope in fusion energy? Let me ask. So, Bella uh, Lu- Lu- Grecia, so, so, <laughs> fusion, this, so, so, there's so, there's a lot of layers to that. But, yeah. but the simplest one for me is it's called Javon's paradox. Right, which is simply the statement that the more accessible we make energy, the more we will use the energy that's accessible to us. Right, there is no such thing as simply creating enough energy to get past wanting more energy. So it's not like let's let's pretend that we're in some world, some universe, thirty years from now, where the planet still exists and fusion finally comes online, and fusion starts small and it builds up because each reactor will be kind of local, right? So we build these fusion reactors and we use that energy. We're still using the fossil fuel. We're still using the solar. We're still using, you know, the natural gas. And now we're also using the fusion energy. So there's no such thing as new energy replacing old energy. Well, maybe a little bit, but, but, but for the most part, new energy means new growth. And that new growth means using that energy, right? And, and still going down our road. So uh, let's see. I'm I'll gonna. Look. I would just. Uh, I, I. I. I just want to amplify uh, Bell, Bella's comment. What I think the discussion is. I, I'm just gonna. I'm. I'm. I'm, I'm sure this man, who is a dear friend of mine, the, the, this man asking this question. Bella Lugrisi. Bella Lugrisi. He is one. One. One of my good buddies. I love that man dearly. But anyway, I'm gonna. Can I take this? The question to the next level. Oh, this I just is added my, I added my superficial little. Uh, 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 okay, I'm gonna s- not center in on fusion. I'm saying I'm gonna make it a true free energy, a limitless, non-polluting, true green, clean energy. I don't know how many people, even the Numisphere, realize this. The absolute worst thing for this planet would be to bring in a 100% free energy, uh, limitless supply of free energy. This planet would be destroyed so much quicker than we're managing to do with our inefficient fossil fuels. It's, uh, we would take that energy like we've taken every energy that we've ever had to us, and it will be used to destroy the planet. The, the more efficient, it's the waste in any energy system that, that's holding us back. It's the only thing putting brakes on us is the inefficiency and the waste in whatever energy technologies we've come up. So the more efficient, the, would that be the higher or the lower EROEI uh, it is whichever one, the, the less energy we need to put into something to get more energy back, the quicker we are going to destroy the planet. Yeah, I mean, great point. And, and uh, actually, honestly, I never thought about it. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Everything, uh, human history, going back, uh, going back to the invention of fire uh, backs this up. Uh, there, there is no reason to believe that humans are, are going to responsibly use any energy source for the betterment of this planet. If, if, they, could, if they could power a bulldozer by sucking the whatever out of the, you know what I'm saying, we would, we would have that many more bulldozers tearing down the Amazon rainforest than we do now. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go on to the next, okay, question. next question. Next question is from Oscar... Oscar again. Now, Oscar Robert. Now, I, I, I love Oscar too, but... Uh, should I find... Uh, I, I think... 
All right, let me, all right, we, all Oscar, right. Oscar, if, if we don't have a question from somebody, you see what I'm saying, brother? I, I mean, I know it's a good question, but we want to, we have a limited amount of time, so what we oh, want to do yeah, is, yeah, right. it, 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 you know what I'm saying. It's, yeah, it's I, I, I can't person. remember who I've asked questions, but I, I'm going to leave remember. that to you to tell me. Oh, all right, I better. Uh, Hemi Bonilla. <laughs> Hemi Bonilla. I know we have not heard from him. Can you tell me how much it will take for Central America to collapse due to a blue ocean event? So, so. I'm going to let you take it. Yeah, right? so I think the blue ocean event is a little bit overblown. I mean, there's some people who like to take these things as a given. It's going to happen, and once it happens, the whole planet's going to just go extinct almost immediately, right? So there are these Feedback that are happening right now in the Arctic that are kind of obscure, but the latest research papers are actually really pointing to this huge slowdown in the trajectory of the Arctic to become ice free. And the reason is really is like paradoxical. But the point is that the more the ocean is open, the more it can get like a thin, quick freeze of ice over it if the temperatures get cold, right? So, so once you have a blue ocean, yeah, you don't get the thick, you know, six foot, two meter plus ice anymore, but you get quick freezes really, you know, where, so, so this last month, as a matter of fact, up until yesterday, up until yesterday, I watch Arctic ice every single day. This last month, we had the record greatest sea ice growth in the month of December since 1979, right? So the fact is that because there's so much open ocean, you get a little bit of cold weather and you get, you get ice on it, right? Very, very quickly. So there's these feedbacks that are kind of weird. And once you get that ice, what happens is the storms blow that ice into, you know, they kind of collect it. So there's this, this slowdown in the blue ocean event, the trajectory for the timing of that. But let's put that aside. Let's suppose what happens, my over-under is about 2030 to 2035 on the first blue ocean event. Let's suppose that happens. And the question is, how long until Central America is impacted by that? It's, you know, easily another decade. Um, it's going to slow down. It, it's not, you know, there's no question that a blue ocean event ultimately is going to cause rapid superheating of the planet. But it's not going to happen in the next five years, 10 years, that we're going to get this global superheating. That's not how things are going to go down, is that a blue ocean event is going to wipe out life on Earth because of superheating. That is not how it's going to happen. So I think that you have to watch sort of this. I, I think there's a lot of fear porn out there. This is one of, yeah. You I'm, know, I'm agreeing with, uh, you know, with Elliot. And, and, and fear porn <laughs> includes a blue ocean event wiping out the planet in two years or five yeah. years or something, or it's going to happen tomorrow or the next, it should have happened in the years 2013 to 2016, but somehow it didn't. There's a lot of fear porn. And among the fear porn are things like the uh, methane bomb from Siberia and the East Arctic uh, uh, Sea. You know, just just the the stuff that's going to come down is is not going to be so easy to to say. Oh, it's going to be this particular event. Although those those could happen. Probabilistically, what we're probably talking about is famine, and famine spreading out from the the heart of, of Africa. And, uh, you know, eventually causing uh, massive immigration, which is going to cause uh, wars. It's going to cause a lot of, uh, of uh, you know, internal and in, within countries where you have immigration from one part of a country to another. I mean, when people move from Florida, you know, up to New up, oh, yeah. upstate New York, they there move from California to <laughs> upstate New York. Sam is going to be defending Bugs in a Jar there Bar. There you go. So, going to get Sancho Panza. So, yeah, I mean, it's a really good question, but it, it's part of that, you know. Is part of that fear porn, this, this blue ocean event. And I just don't buy into to that kind of doom scale about that. All right, I'm, uh, I, I generally agree with, with everything uh, that Elliot just said. The only thing I would add to that, say, whether whatever the individual conversation, whenever I hear one aspect of collapse being isolated, and too much, too much attention being paid to it. And, and, I would, and I would put the whole subject of climate change, which is a very important aspect of collapse. It's not all of it. But how many times, this is a broken record. If, if, if climate change, including the blue ocean event, was nowhere on the, uh, on the radar, if humans were doing absolutely zero, to change the climate, there's 
so many other things at play. Even without climate change pitching in, there's enough different uh, ecological crises unfolding on this planet to, to uh, collapse the planet. Uh, so just if, if we were to solve one of these little things, uh, it's not, it, it, it's not, uh, gonna, gonna, gonna save the planet at this point. It, it, it might be one of those stair step things where we'll, the, the step will come up a little bit, but it's never going to get back as high as the step above it. Uh, I, I, I call it the toxic stew of, uh, the, uh, of threats against this planet, trying to take out one ingredient of the toxic stew taking down this planet. It's, it, it, anyway, this is why I, I, I try to look at things uh, from a more generalist perspective. It, I call it perma I call it temper frost and perma crisis. That's good. That's perma crisis. Yeah, perma, perma, crisis. perma crisis. Yeah, plural. Yeah. Anyway, so I like this question. You can take it if you want. I'm going to ask it. This is from Dragon Tail Terror. Oh yes, my dear friend Dragon Tail. Are there any? Moment. Are there any future scenarios? I, I love this question because I'm. I, are there any future scenarios where all the rabbits, she yeah, specifies yeah. rabbits, oh, right? I, 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 and I, birds I, survive I, I, while I, the I, humans I, all die. All right. So, so, so. She is a rabbit phobe. So, I mean, a uh, rabbit or a rabbit. I love it. I feed She's my rabbit. rabbit. I, got, I, put out, I put out food for the local rabbits every day. And so, do, I, I, I love my rabbits. So, yeah, I so have. So, I. Food. One more time. Read the so question. are are there scenarios we can see where somehow the humans all die off, yeah. but the birds survive okay. and the bunnies survive? Okay, we don't we don't care about the lizards. We don't care about the goldfish, rabbits, and rabbits birds. and birds. Okay, nothing. Okay, what was that survives? I mean, maybe some other things survive besides rabbits. So what she's wondering is essentially is the, is there a future in which humans can survive without taking down all of nature? You know, without without essentially decimating most of the creatures on this planet, is there a way that humans can, you know, are going to get out of the way here, and the the planet will somehow, you know, still? Be it's uh, well, the sooner humans go, the better the chance the rabbits and the birds have. Uh, I personally think the smart money is on jellyfish to uh, be the. Uh, mm -hmm. Not rabbit. If I had to put the smart money on what species is going to most likely to survive us and be the original gene pool, to uh, I don't think there's going to be any vertebrates. Coming you don't think any cockroaches are going to? Well, happen? that would be my only other one. On land, there might be a few irradiated cockroaches. We got irradiated cockroaches on land. And jellyfish. Uh... I'm a little more optimistic. I mean, my whole perspective in in, in what I do, uh, I'm an environmentalist, right? So, so I'm gonna. I'm sorry for using the e word around you, Sam, but my my view is humans are going out, right? Yeah. So let's do what we can every day to save as much of the planet as we can for whatever comes next. I'm hoping there still be birds and bunnies around in what comes next. That that humans will at least. Some opium. Um, the age word. You did hear opium. Yeah. <laughs> My hope is that when humans are gone, <laughs> right, there'll still be birds and bunnies. That I definitely am. am, am if, if, any, if any vertebrate were to survive humanity. It's going to be underground be, moles, rats. Yeah, yeah. It, um, it, it would be moles and shrews. That's exactly mm -hmm. what it would be. Uh, that, that's the, the only vertebrate that stands a chance is, or, or, uh, are moles and shrews. Uh, not not. Sh yeah, uh, still... Shrews come up pretty often, aren't they? Moles pretty much live under there, don't Go they? Gophers. Yeah, and go. go okay, okay. Well, gophers. Okay. Gophers are gophers, forever. Yeah, yeah. If gophers can survive, because they're rodents, so maybe uh, gophers will inherit the earth. I'm going to take this next question because right, I know about this. This is okay. from uh, uh, Anselmo Connor. Okay. Question: When will the next El Nino come about, right. and how hard hitting will it be? Well. Um, the latest ENSO, so we're third year of La Nina, is currently putting a 50-50 chance uh, of El Nino roughly at the end of the next Northern Hemisphere summer. So we're talking uh, July, August, September. In that range of three months, about a 50-50 chance of, 23 or of 2023, right? Okay. 
So what that means would be that the superheating effect of that El Nino would sort of uh, hit the southern hemisphere in the 23-24 uh, summer down there, right? And hit the northern hemisphere in the in the 2024 summer. And we have this huge latent heat that's in the oceans right now, just, just unbelievable latent heat there. So, you know, the IPCC uh, predicted, I, I might have the wrong attribution there, they predicted uh, just about a year ago that we had a 50-50 chance of breaking 1.5 temporarily before the year 2026. So my particular over-under is a 50-50 chance in the year 2024 of planetary 1.5. And it might just be that one year we might go back to La Nina and go down, right? But I'm right now, if, if you want to make a bet in the climate casino, you would bet either side of that 2024 1.5 is about a 50-50 chance, in my opinion. So, you know, I'm going to... I won't even weigh in on that. That was much more intelligent than anything I could say about the situation. All I'm right. just waiting to, to, to report it as it as it happens. Yes, I'll, you I will be. I will be After, covering yes. it. Yeah. I love this question from uh, Foggy Sunset. I, I, Foggy Sunset. Foggy Sunset. Okay. I know Foggy Sunset. You know Foggy. One of my, one of my right. favorite people on okay. the planet is, is Foggy Sunset. I've been in acceptance mode, uh, re eco doom for years now but I can't get to acceptance of fascism doom at this point. <laughs> Are you still more terrified of methane than of man's inhumanity to man? Which, which of those for you is bigger? What, what, you know, the wars and the fascism and what we're gonna do to each other or of what methane, you know, the future of methane spells for the planet? Ne neither of the above. I am worried about what fascism I is going to do to our fellow Earthlings. I, I really don't give. I I'm not. I'm not. Okay, I that would be a little too strong. That I really don't care what fascists do to humans. I am. A, I am much more concerned about what fascism, capitalism, any ism on the planet is doing to our to our fellow earthlings and what it's doing to humans because humans deserve everything we have coming to us whatever form it takes but that is uh so that's how i'm going none of the above is all right I, my answer i i have a different answer than okay. you so, so right. you know that's not, what not all doomers agree with all other doomers you ask you know uh, 10 doomers what does it mean to yeah. be a doomer you get 10 different answers <laughs> 11 different answers 11 different answers because i changed my opinion overnight yeah. um so I'm definitely more concerned about about uh, fascism than I am about methane, but methane's no no small problem either, right? So so methane is going crazy right now. I, I write a lot about methane. I look at methane every single day. I you know methane is a, is a personal obsession of mine. So I know a lot about methane. I don't know much about fascism, but you'll be learning <laughs> real quick, bro. <laughs> you'll know a lot more next week than you do this week. But anyway. yeah, no, no. <laughs> Watching what's going on with with Elon Musk right yeah, now Elon. and Twitter is, is just a, just a microcosm uh, of what fascism yeah. looks like, right? You want to you want to yeah. boil down fascism to a single metaphor. It would be Elon what Elon Musk is doing right now on Twitter. And the ninety nine dollar deck of cards. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, you have the <laughs> NFTs with Donald Trump as well, right? Yeah, so. That's a good. Uh... And, lesson uh, into fast forward and fast forward. Right. So ninety nine dollars. So I you know, I I don't own a weapon that I would defend myself with, but I'm not sure I would want to live in a world where I would have to defend myself exactly. anyway. Exactly. So uh yeah, no, Foggy Sun said thank you. That is a mm -hmm. deep uh question. Yeah. That's very, very um insightful right there. Okay. So Sultan Bev says the pain of knowing the truth is less than the pain of living the lie for me. Uh, yeah, so, so I mean, you don't really know what the pain of living the lie is, right? So, uh, you know, all you need to do is go to, go to your local mall, go to your local Kmart or Walmart. or <laughs> watch you're living a lie. Yeah. And, well, just look at the people around you, you know, and, and you can experience, the, you know, you, you know the pain because you see it in these people, right, who are, are doing this. But, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I could not imagine a, a life without this awareness of what's going on on the planet. It just, it, it's not possible, right? It is not possible to be living a life without knowing this stuff. Well, for you, for the people in this group, but for the vast majority of people, uh, they're, they're living the lie. 
yeah. gladly. Now, I, I, I am not claiming for one minute that I'm not participating uh, in, in, in all kinds of systems that are doing what horrify me. I, so, anyway. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, knowing the truth. I want to go back to uh, Dragon Tail Tarot again here. She, uh, she or he? Yeah, I guess that she. I, she I, I can see the icon there. As much as I love this woman, Era, where I you have you, <laughs> she's already had a question. But anyway, uh, she gets, no, this is not a question. Oh, okay, okay. This is a comment. Okay. I was 11 years old when right. I started to wake up to what was happening to us, and I was okay with it. As much as sometimes it would be nice to be blissfully ignorant, I wouldn't want it for myself. So yeah, eleven years old is is uh, quite young, and uh, you know I'm I'm uh, I don't know I have um, personally a, a four year old and a seven year old grandkid, and my my way of going through uh, this is um, that I'm not going to go out of my way to tell these kids right right I'm not going to spoil this illusion as long as they want to have it they they can have their illusion I'm I'm not but I know with 100% certainty that at some point in their life, they're going to be looking out and going, what the fuck is yeah. going on on this planet right now? And at that point, I will be willing to answer whatever questions they have. While you're in your bomb shelter. Yeah. Talking. Yeah. Well, I'm calling them up from the, from the bomb shelter. Uh, Right. Hopefully they have a shortwave radio yeah. and, and they have solar uh, power yeah, generator yeah, yeah. for the shortwave so that we can talk. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm going to have to go uh, some duplicate some people because we're getting some great. I'm just going to. I'm going to. You're uh, the moderator. I'm going to read some. Uh, but not comments. three questions. So astrologer climate witness says, but that yeah, thin ice melts you. earlier in spring. Of course it does. Yeah. Well, I never thought the BOE would wipe out the planet in a quick minute. It is another big feedback to hasten stuff along. Yeah. So there are feedback loops right there. Are, I honestly. Every day I do this thing on Twitter called a moment of doom. And the last week or so, I identified three or four. I mean, you read an article, right? And it's about this methane thing or this or that. And you all of a sudden the light dawns and that's a feedback loop, right? That is yet another feedback loop. And there are so many of these things, right? There so are. yeah. So yeah, yet another feedback loop. Uh, this Nick, I cannot say your last name, says, what is unknowable, Elliot, is how fast the latent heat effect of the Blue Ocean event feeds into enhanced liberation of methane and CO2 from permafrost and clathrates. Um, well, Nick, you know, I mean, it's a good point, but the thing is that, like, they're already doing isotope studies. Uh, you know, how much methane is coming out of, out of Siberia? How, how deep is that? Like, what's the layer of ice that's blocking the melting, uh, the, the methane from rising through that ice and coming out into atmosphere? And there is at least one person who is sort of raising alarm bells about methane. But really, if you look at like the majority, and I am a scientist through and through, if you look at the majority of research papers, none of them is saying this is a imminent, you know, methane bomb in the next three years, five years, 10 years. There, there's no consensus that that's going to happen. What is a much more serious hap, uh, thing going on with methane is um, the hydroxyl radical uh, being cannibalized by uh, the fires, the you know that the the green hydrogen, um, the the cleaner fuel for jets. I mean, there are so many reasons methane is spiking that is due to the loss of a sink, as opposed to the increase in a source. And if you sort of change your focus to the sinks rather than the source, it's kind of like taking the pill for you know coming out of the cave for methane. Once you realize what's really going on with methane are the sinks and not the sources, that opens up an entire universe on methane that I really encourage people to, to study up on and, and then they really know what's going on with that. I'm going to find us another question. So I'm moderating while we're doing this. So I'm kind of, um, uh, uh, I just, these are such great questions. Thank you all for these great questions. I, I, I want to read this. Um, so Zagonda26, who is a new person, makes the oh. comment, if you watch Jim Massa, do you know this person? Yeah, 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 he's yeah, an oceanographer. Yeah. His videos, he explains that oceans will be the big driver of future yeah. climate change. Yeah, I'm with him. I'm with Jim on that one for sure. With so much heat and energy stored inside them. Yeah, um, just 
unbelievable amount of heat. So roughly right now, what's happening? Do you mind me? No, no. I'm dominating. Yeah. I want to give you a speech. But what's happening right now is the equivalent of about 12 Hiroshima bombs a second worth of energy and heat going into heating the oceans. So the net heating of our ocean at this particular moment in history is the equivalent of 12 Hiroshima bombs per second going off in the ocean. So, so you it's know, a good century to be a jellyfish. I, if you like warm water, uh, you know. <laughs> I mean, one of the big problems with the oceans is ocean acidification, right? And so that that's a big thing. Jim Mass, yeah, I mean, he knows all this stuff. There are. Uh, I mean, you can just, uh, you never have to leave the ocean if we're looking at permanent crises. In 55, we could do a whole channel uh, just on, uh, uh, on what, uh, the, crap. Uh, the oceans are completely fine. Yes, yeah, the They're third fine. it's the third bleaching in five years I mean, in they, Australia. I mean, <laughs> coral reefs right on down to, in, in this deep sea, uh, I know mining. now they're going to be trolling. Um, I, I, I don't even, you, you, you can just throw a dart in the ocean and uh, the, the oceans are uh, yeah, more. I, I mean, yeah, there. It's, <laughs> it's, the plastic, the mining, the, the acidification, the heating. Good yeah, lord, yeah. the whale strikes, yeah. the uh, melting the the Antarctic glaciers from beneath. Good lord, I, I, I mean, go on. You don't even have to climb up on land. Yeah, too. Yeah. Uh, you can be a tumor. You can yeah, be a purely you, you, an ocean tumor. Yeah, oh, oh yeah. You need to be a land based tumor. Probably, there probably are. That's probably the ocean rabbit hole of the doomosphere. My uh, God. I, I like Rachel Albright's comment. Oh, She's okay. wondering whether tardigrades are going to survive uh, doom. Well, they're on Mars. They, they might have. <laughs> they can do Mars, didn't they send them to Mars? We love our tardigrades. I mean, are you kidding me? No, I they honestly well, think they yeah, didn't they, they send them to Mars. Or they put them in a zero gravity vacuum for you know six months. And they well, put I them think this is. I, I I'm actually okay with panspermia, uh, which is what the tardigrades are. I, I strangely enough. I absolutely don't want, I mean, the, 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 the biggest doomer nightmare is humans getting out of this planet, but I'm okay with uh, with blasting Mars with tardigrades. I, you know, I, I don't have a problem uh, with it. We are so worried about bringing <laughs> back alien viruses to our own planet, right? I mean, when we went to the moon and came back, they isolated uh, these people yeah. for a month, so they, but we don't care at all about bringing our viruses. Let's keep to this these. virus contained to this planet, but we don't know, care we wanna, about that. If we want to blast some tardigrades off to a lifeless planet, uh, uh. so Andre says, in two years, no one will be confused. Do you think in two years, uh, people two will still years. be confused? I think I will have more subscribers in two years than I do now. I, I'm, you know what? I'm going to give. 20 to 1 odds <laughs> that you have more subscribers in two years than you do today on, on uh, Collapse Chronicles. Mm. Mm. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I like these questions. These are really okay. great. Um, Sam? Yes? I, I, I got to ask you this question. This is a question. Who's right? This is from Oscar Roberts. So, okay. so we, don't have, we don't have 500 people okay. in chat, so I How have to do we have here? I don't know. That's on yeah. another... Sam, this is to you. Okay. Would you consider having a relationship with a non-doomer woman? Uh, absolutely. Uh, however, there there is no non-doomer woman who would consider having a relationship with me. Well, well, hypothetically, if you did, what do you think the main issues would be between you and this woman? If you were, you know, you found the perfect non-doomer woman who would have you for everything you are. Like, what do you? So that's weird. The record, there, this is a psychological question. What issues would you have with a non-doomer woman that you happen to be in a relationship? I, I, again, it would be her issues with me. I, 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 I have a whole lot of, uh, of good female friends who are, uh, who are not doomer chicks. I, I know very few. I mean, in, in my, quote, real life, my pre- rabbit hole life uh you know in austin texas i have many many female friends and and understand and i think this is true for uh I, I, well i don't want to speak for elliot i do not sound like this i sound like this on uh on, on youtube for uh 20 30 minutes a day for the other 23 and a half hours 
uh, we, Elliot and I were just laughing. I've never met this man. I, don't, I, got, I, I got here three days ago, hanging out with this man. And, and you don't know how, in 72 hours, how many hours that Elliot Jacobson and Sam Mitchell have spent talking about this? Yeah. Little, yeah. We're, we're talking to me, you know, we're talking yeah. about crazy stories that happened uh, to us growing up and sh just what everybody talks about. Uh, so e, 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 like when, you know, when Sandy and I are hanging out, a uh, very little uh, of our time. And I mean, I, I, I'm perfectly open to a relationship with a non doomer chick, but I just know it would not work. So this is why you always hear me whining about looking for my doomer chick forever. Uh, I want to answer Olivia, uh, Chippenfield's question All right. because, uh, I mm. hate this question. You hate uh, it or you uh, ate it? I hate this question. Oh, and I don't hate many things. I hate this question, okay. so I need to answer it. Okay. Jim Mass has said we are 1.6 centigrade total heating if taken from the original 1750 baseline. Okay, the 1750, so IPCC totally screwed up in their first four reports. Maybe it's three, maybe it's four. They said we are going to use the 1750 pre-industrial baseline. Well, the pre-industrial baseline, what the language actually said was the 30-year window centered at 1750. So 1735 to 1765 is their baseline. Let's take the average temperatures. Let's measure the total heating from there. The problem is that we did not have thermometers all over the planet measuring how hot the planet was at that time. That if you want to go back to 1750, you have to use proxies. You have to use yeah. things that let you sort of guess what the temperature is through a secondary measurement. So the IPCC, for some reason, decided that's what they're going to do. Let, let's, you know, because that's when we started using coal. So it's a natural thing, right? So they finally came to their senses and said, let's start, let's use 1850 to 1900, because that's the time period we had, you know, reliable measurements of temperature around the planet that we can get reasonable estimates of the true measure of, of warming on the planet. So they switched to 1750 to 1800, I believe in the fifth report, for sure, and, and also in the sixth. And everybody said, oh, it's a big conspiracy, it's a big conspiracy. But if you read the IPCC reports, they are very careful to then spell out in pain, uh, they, they go out of their way to say, let us actually do our best case estimate of what happened between the 1750 baseline and the right 1850 to 1900. And it makes complete sense. I mean, if you just think about the total amount of coal and carbon and everything else that was actually emitted during that period, it's not a lot, right? You're it's talking just, 1750. 18, yes, it's not a lot. It's like we did not have 8 billion people driving cars and flying and, and industry. We had people burning coal to, to stay warm, right? And it's just, it wasn't a lot. And so what they actually, the IPC estimates is somewhere between 0.1 and 0.3 degrees Celsius of warming century. For, from the 1750 baseline to the 1850 to 1900, right? Which means roughly if we had 1.2 from the 1850 baseline, right? And we have somewhere between 1.3 and 1.5 overall, right? And I, I, I believe these people, look, I am a scientist, right? He is I, a left brainer. I have a PhD in mathematics. I have a professor of mathematics. I've published in scientific journals. I know what the refereeing process is. I know what scientists are. I know what the whole uh, paradigm of science is. And I trust scientists who are, are producing peer-reviewed articles to not be just making stuff up. But there are people out there who just make stuff up. They just they just misinterpret stuff for, for some doom porn reason. And I am not that Big person. Man. And you are not this person. No, no, I don't know who you're talking about. I've never heard that before in my I've life. I've never heard about but the, the I have no idea who you, you could be talking about. <laughs> all right. So anyway, we will move off from the big horn sheep man. All right. All right. So <clears throat> Rachel Nelson asks. Okay. Is that good? Is that was all right? What I just did there? Yeah, I, Let's you, drink to that one. All right. Yeah. We're going to go on, but we're going to have you, a nice switch. You swig triggered here. the left brain. I uh, noticed I triggered you. You triggered the uh, left brain. I don't know brain. who you're talking about, so I'm not in full. All right, Rachel, you're well, up. Well, way up there, she asks, she's wondering whether rats will survive. Yes, Rachel will give you rats. They're going to live. We already it. did. We already went through this question. All right, but she uh, asks here. What rabbits, rats? <laughs> how much of the Earth's population will die from heat waves that are coming for 2024? I mean, just this, how, much, how many people are going to die from heat waves in 2024? Um, 
So, I mean, a great question. This whole wet bulb, you know, yeah. conversation. Are there going to be a million people dying from heat waves? You know, I mean, this 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 book that was that was you know this um, idea that that we're going to suddenly have uh, all these people dying from from heat in India. You know, a million people, and then they're going to come to their senses and spray sulfur. I think. I think this is the book that you are thinking about, right? Is that I the book right wrong. there, uh, the Ministry for the Future, Kim Stanley Robinson, um, where the, where the book starts off, right? With with you have it upside down. Yeah, right. <laughs> where the book starts off with you know some two million people in India dying from this wet bulb uh, heat wave. So yeah, that's coming. There's no question that's coming, and it could it you know it could happen any time in any part of the world, and it's certainly going to be more likely in 2024 than in any time in human history before that. Um, but I can't, you know, I just, it's just pure speculation to try and guess how many people might, you know, how bad a heat wave. I mean, UK got up to uh, 104 degrees, right? London did, you know, that wasn't predicted until 2100, right? So, I mean, I mean, this stuff is coming down fast. And, well, and one, the thing that I usually, but, I, but I'm not gonna keep it quiet now, when I'm reading all of this wet bulb stuff, and I and, and and I guess we're waiting to see. I was raised in Atlanta, Georgia. Okay, I, I was raised in Atlanta, Georgia, in a house with no air conditioning. All right, I I did I had no air conditioning in my house or my car in Atlanta, Georgia, growing up, and it got hot and humid as hell uh, every day for six months a year. Uh, absolutely miserable, and we didn't even have AC. And 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 I was the child of a, a you know a successful physician in Atlanta when he built his house in 1956, no air conditioning. And and I'm and I'm looking at the, the, these what they're calling wet bulb temperatures, and I'm. St- what the hell? That I grew up in these wet bulb temperatures without not, without an air conditioner, but not lethal wet bulb. Well, well I, it, 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 it's just what I remember growing yeah. up in, and I don't remember people uh, dropping dead. I'm not saying that it's not going to happen. I, I, this is just one of those where I, I just I, I I hear a little bit of doomer porn, uh, fear porn sneaking into it. Yeah, I, th- I think uh, you know that's one of the thing about being a doomer. Is being a doomer is different from like like just being a fear porn uh, you know purveyor. Like let me tell you more fear porn. Let me tell you about all the the horrible things. That being a for me being a doomer is being a realist, and that includes not going off that. You know, trying to measure like like realities uh, of these things. And this is why you know on my website I have the climate casino because. I try and assign probabilities to these events as opposed to people who just make make pure predictions of doom, right? No, let there are probabilities. There's a spectrum of future things. You know, you're gonna you're gonna play roulette and and you may or may not get get the number 34 to show up in you know twice in a row and have wet bulb. Um, but I wanted to just talk about that for a second. So here in Santa Barbara, right? Nobody has air conditioning. I live I live four miles from the ocean. This is a Mediterranean climate. No house here has, has air conditioning. It got to 114 degrees, right? I mean, how could it get to 114 degrees here? It, it's impossibly hot. You have no Maybe idea. Seattle and Portland. Uh, yeah, you have no idea how hot that is when you have no air conditioning, <laughs> right? We got in my car and just, that, just, yeah, just yeah. drove, yeah, right? We, yeah, there, yeah. we had no, nothing else we could do to survive. I mean, you could not go in the shower because the second you stepped out of the shower, you were you, you, already, a Walmart. Oh, you don't have a Walmart. We do not have a Walmart. For a right. cooling center. So that is a, a great, great question. Um, let's see. But there, I don't think they're, they're, that either one of us are saying by any comment we just made that it's not going to have a higher probability down the line than it does now. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, it's one of the one of the perma crises. Um, all right. Let's see. Um, Olivia, I'm just going to read a couple comments. Olivia Chippenfield says, "I could never be with a non-doomer. I'd always feel frustrated." There's a knowledge gap. All right. Uh, 
my wife, I yeah, mean, yeah. I, she kind of, she kind of is like, she's very spiritual and religious, and she's like, oh yeah, but she kind of yeah. understands. She's kind of a doomer. I mean, a little tiny. Bit. But she doesn't consider herself a doomer. Uh, no, no, no. So, so this person whose name on Twitter, they're actually logged into chat as aerosol masking. So uh, you're gonna probably tell me I'm wrong. Out. I'm gonna let him. Out you're gonna tell me I'm wrong. Uh, Unfortunately, James Hansen, James Lovelock, you're quoting everybody, and Michael Mann. Michael Mann still advocate for nuclear power as the solution to our predicament. What do you think about nuclear power? I don't want to answer that question. It, I want you to talk about it. It's me. beginning to sound like a broken record. It's uh, it, it's it, it, it's one more. Uh, it, it, it's one more ingredient in the stew. It's absolutely, it, 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 again, if it did work, it would be, it would cause the problem that I was talking about before with fusion. With fusion if, it, yeah. if, if it really does work, it, 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 it's work, it, it's every bit as bad as it blowing up now. If, if, you, if you go through, take it to, to the extreme, whether it's nuclear power, nuclear fusion, whatever it is, you, you have that end of the spectrum to look at, but anybody uh, that's holding up nuclear power, uh, at, at, well, it's, it's all hopium. Uh, so, I mean, I, I throw it in there with, with every other one, but that, that's me, but he's the scientist. I'm yeah. just the one who, who, who just tries to. Yeah, I'm going to have you read that to yourself, um, this question, right? And you can decide whether you want to answer that question or not right oh, there. Boy. Yeah, How you read you that one. This? You're my age. I know. I just got. I got. Uh, uh, this another Bella Lugrisi. Yeah, you don't have to say what the question is. Do you want to answer that one? Uh, you don't have to. We'll just skip it. It just sounds like you didn't want. To. No, uh, yeah, Bella. Sorry. I I I uh, ask you not to uh, be, <laughs> be bringing this up. I mean, it, this this is. A delicate subject for a couple more weeks. We 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 know something, all right. That's all yeah. I'm say. All right. That I just continues. talked to the man from the airport a couple of nights ago. So anyway, it, it, that will all be explained. Uh, look what Foggy weeks. Sun said. You guys are a great team. All right. We are. We are the <laughs> Abbott and Costello of the Dumas. Now, which one of us is Abbott? Which is good. Now, if we could just have Bella with her. I know. Uh, uh, yeah. Oh, God. If the three yeah. of us could get together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, let's see. Shout out to all this Atlanta folks. I know those summers with no air conditioning. Wow. I was in Kentucky, I think. In, in, Who was that from, that comment? Was um, that from? Uh, that was from Dragon Tail yeah, Tarot. Yeah, yeah I she, was. She and she's an Atlanta girl. I'm an Atlanta uh, boy. Yeah, you have no anybody on the planet. You have no idea what hot and humid means until you're in Atlanta. Yeah, Atlanta being I mean, raised in like like uh, Ariel and I you, were. You, you, we, walk, we, uh, you walk outside and you cannot it, breathe. You know, like that air is so hot. It, you you just it my takes your uh, my brother-in-law. Uh, he calls living in Atlanta in the living inside a marshmallow. He's from uh, Connecticut, and that's what he calls Atlanta in the summertime is living inside a marshmallow. Can't stand it. Uh, let's see. Um, Nick, uh, I can't say your last name, says you cannot spray a meaningful amount of, of stratospheric sulfates without uh, uh, adversely affecting photosynthesis. Yeah, I don't know about that. I mean, I, I will believe that you are, are citing uh, some paper on that. Um, I just think in general, we that'll never happen. It, it, you know, it, it, we're it's not a bad gonna, idea. We are never going to be on the point in this planet where we have 700, uh, you know, Army or, or Air Force quality, um, um, you know, air refuelers, uh, you know, spraying sulfates 24-7. To, to help cool the planet by 0 0.1 degrees Celsius, you know, and... and well, the geo the geoengineering and particularly solar radiation management, uh, it, it is one of the classic frying pan or fires uh, contradictions of the 20... One, one, one of the classic, uh, and there's so many of them, but uh, yeah, it, so, it makes... No, e either way, we... Uh, we don't. If we don't geoengineer, we're going to fry. If we do geoengineer, we're going to burn. It, it, it's at this point. So, so a couple quick comments. Uh, Sultan Bev says that that air conditioning is still rare in the UK. 
Um, yeah, yeah. Um, like it's rare here in Santa Barbara. I mean, we're just. I mean, UK is a, is is. I mean, the the feeling about the UK is like anybody says, "What is the weather in like in the UK?" It's foggy with a, with drizzle, right? That is that is universally the weather supposed to. Be. Yeah, no, used to be. Uh, Nick says, and I love you saying this, Nick. No, you did not have ninety degree wet bulb in Atlanta. I mean, a lot of people don't understand what wet bulb means, but. But essentially what it means is you take a thermometer and you saturate the bulb so that there can be no cooling doing, due to evaporation, that you are measuring a temperature without evaporative cooling taking place. So yeah, essentially 95 degree wet bulb is absolutely 100% lethal. So, so 90% uh, uh, wet bulb or 90 degree wet bulb would be killing large parts of the population of Atlanta but you, you might have had 110 degrees with 30% with humidity, which is still intolerably hot and humid. So, so saying a temperature and a humidity is not the same as saying, oh, this was that thing wet bulb. Uh, but Nick- but I'm, I'm just saying when I see stories on it and, and they give me the temperature and humidity ranges, I feel like I grew up in that. Yeah, but but I mean I mean I see where they're they're they're, they're talking wet and bubble like eighty two. Have you ever been in, have now. you ever been in a sauna where you can pour water like on rocks or or you know you can create yeah. the humidity? I hate saunas. So, I don't understand so, the attraction of those damn things. Look, I was married to a woman who we lived in a we lived in a teepee, all right? Oh. We had a sauna that we had created, like like one of these, you know, with, with blankets. We would heat rocks in a campfire, we'd put the rocks in the middle of the sun and we'd pour water on them. Once you're in 140 degrees and you start pouring water on rocks. 140 and, degrees, okay. Yeah, because it's the sun, right? And, and right. you pour water yeah. on this, wow. you get humidity. You can last about two minutes now. Yeah, well, you know, yeah. But, yeah. 140. Because it's a sauna, right? <laughs> you want I'm sauna. talking about, I, I would have to look it up. I, I swear I remember seeing some of these wet bulbs where they were talking 82 degree Fahrenheit. I don't give a shit what the humidity is at 82 degrees Fahrenheit with, yeah. with 90% humidity. Yeah. Whether brutal. that was, anyway, that, that's just it's brutal. Kind of a, yeah. but it was brutal growing up. Uh, there's no way I'm spending the summer in Atlanta, Georgia. That's why the hell I live in the Finger Lakes in New York in the summer. So, so Foggy Sunset asks, haven't you ever lived outside the U.S.? I know you have lived. I've outside. lived seven years in Latin America. Without, right, right with, around the equator. With, with no air conditioning. That's right. three years in Costa Rica, two years in Peru, two right. years in Ecuador, never had uh, a, a AC down there. I never dropped dead and I never saw any, but, but, but right. it could be pretty damn miserable walking down the yeah. beach in Costa and Rica at I, Palmer I, Beach at, uh, at two o'clock in the afternoon, man. And I've spent at least half a year myself in, in Macau and Singapore and Cambodia and those parts of the world. So yeah. Which would be similar, yeah. Yeah, I mean, just, just, just tough, just tough. Um, I like this question. I, I you know, uh, this is a great one. Astro mm -hmm. Astrologer, climate witness, right. right? The astrologer. She's a neighbor of mine in New York. So, so all right. Question again. Don't you think that the leaders know that civilization is not going to last that much longer, and they are positioning themselves? I, you know, this is one that uh, I, I really don't know how to answer the question. Uh, I, I hear people on um, um, radical opposite sides of the fence on this, uh, and, and, and they both make sense to me. It's, it's like being down here, it, it, it's so hard for us to believe that they can't. How could they not be that clueless? Uh, be that, you know, but at the same time, then I go out and look at 99% of the people. And, and, and you know uh, what makes them any different than, and, and, and especially if, if their money is one hundred percent being made on denying reality. Uh, so yeah, there's utility in ignorance. Is is I think the point. So utility is like a benefit, like a financial or or emotional or, yeah. or you know, if there is a benefit yeah. to ignorance, then then people will yeah. over a benefit to knowledge. And people, it's not a question of, of do I want this or do I want that, right? It's a question of, of, of humans are drawn to survival. And survival means means what sort of uh, mental or psychological uh, trains of thought will give you the greatest chance of procreating and 
giving offsprings and having your genes survive, right? And so among those is choosing a reality, a, a mental framework, you know, that coincides with, with optimizing your chance of your genes being passed along. So I, I don't think politicians are any different from the people in Kmart in this respect, right? There's not something special about yeah. politicians that, that obligates them to know this information. My guess is it, it, I don't see any reason why it shouldn't be any different than the normal, than the normal bell curve. And, and just in, in, in uh, general society. I, I, I'm not going to sit here and pretend like 100% of the leaders are clueless. It, 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 my guess is like in the general population, there are a few people who get it and, and most of them don't. And uh, over the next few years, more and more of, of our leaders will, uh, will get it too. Uh, it's like, but, but I don't see why it needs to be any different than the general population. Yeah, no, I completely, uh, 100% agree with you. They are, there's nothing special about being a politician. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> nothing at all. All right, uh, Rachel, I love your question. This one's for me. I'm going to 100% take this. Yeah. What does it look like to bet on collapse? Okay, right? That is, Just all like... short on human civilization on Earth. What is what is one investor time and energy in this life? So, so what is... Let me take that. What does it look like to bet on collapse? Um, so what it means is that you make, you make, actually you can chime in on this. You can, you can make decisions for everyday life that are consistent with this truth, right? With knowing this truth. And for me, for me personally, those decisions I boil down to three principles. And I, I write about these all the time. Those principles are, are service, like finding ways, uh, causes. I don't care what your cause is. Find a cause, whether it is journalism, you know, talking about the truths and exposing and, and having a way of presenting this information. Or like me right now, I volunteer for Planned Parenthood. I volunteered as a docent at a zoo, right? I volunteered for the Wildlife Care Network. Find a way to be of service. The second one is be generous. And generosity looks like we all have, I mean, as part of this world, right? We have more than we need. We have more stuff. We have more money. We have more food. I mean, we have more of everything than we need is give it away. Find ways to give whatever you have away to people who, who would benefit by it or animals that would benefit, benefit by it or a, a habitat of any sort. Do whatever you can to give it away. And the third one is kindness. And kindness, I don't know. You and I might have a different opinion of kindness. I, uh, but we might be the same too, I don't know. But I mean, I just try not to be an ass. I fail at kindness more than I fail at absolutely anything else, but I'm still committed to kindness. So, so for me, that's what it means to bet on collapse, is to live your life according to those principles. I'm, uh, not, I'm a little bit confused by your answer because I, I, maybe I don't, I, I didn't necessarily hear her ask the question that you answered. I'm not, oh, well, well, but I don't, but I, but, 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 well, what but maybe, maybe, <laughs> do you want me I, to I get actual odds? No, I'm, I, I understood the question to read it. And so one of us, or, or both of us, both don't, of us. don't understand the both, question you're asking. Clearly both what of does us. it mean to bet? I thought the question she was asking, uh, to bet that we're going to collapse as opposed to that we're not going to. And so, so what I, I, what I'm hearing you say. So you're taking that literally. I was thinking metaphorically. I am a Virgo. Uh, I, I, I thought she literally meant if you were in a debate uh, with, and you were defending that we're going to collapse. That's what I heard her asking, but maybe you heard her correctly. I, you know, you could very well be correct. And all I can say is like, like one of the things I do on my website uh, is I respond to um, collapse crises that, that are, you know, I, I see in the news when I'm reading, I'm reading stuff every day, and whenever something strikes me as this would make a good bet, when this would make a good wager, like let's bet on collapse, I have my website, climatecasino.net, yeah. and I actually have a climate yeah. casino there where I spell out the event and my odds for that yeah, event. Yeah, that's what I think she's saying. Yeah, yeah I, I absolutely, 100%. You know, you want to know my odds for a blue ocean event. You want to know my odds for wet bulb, my odds for population, my odds for extinction. I've got all of that stuff on my site. So, there you go. Yeah. 
All right, uh, let's well, see. the odds of it's not collapsing are zero. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <I> will. <laughs> That's the important one. What are All the right. odds that we're not fucked? Uh, zero. Okay. Uh, you know this Colony of Cells person, right? I do know Colony of Cells. Welcome aboard, brother. All right, Colony of Cells says we should invest in the weapons companies because we need more resource wars. Yes, uh, he, the Colony is a big fan of the resource wars. Oh, and, man, uh, I don't even want to get close to that question. Co colony, is uh, he has a unique uh, worldview that All I right. really enjoy. All um, right. So, so Fred uh, Gunter says, mm -hmm. uh, hello, Doomers. Well, hello to hello you back, too, Fred. Fred. I, I appreciate you. And let's see, Ian. Uh, ah, the evil uh, of stupid questions. I didn't see the stupid question to which you're referring to. There's this fellow, uh, Stan Willenbring. So Stan is, is somebody who I follow on okay. Twitter and he follows me. And, and I really think Stan is, I believe, a PhD. I forget the particular area, but, but also somebody who lives out, I think, like, in the middle of nowhere, like knows very few, just, just you know, lives in a little seven by seven, uh, um, tiny house, hey, on a, you know. He said, um, what, but what would the jellyfish eat? <laughs> you know, just, so, no, no, no. That's not his real question. Your thoughts about the threshold for a minimum number of variety of species needed to make a go of it. So I, now I'm remembering, this is his PhD expertise. I've got to answer this one. Stan, I have no clue. You are an expert on, on, on this particular topic. I could not name a number, a minimum uh, number of species that need to, uh, you know, this is what the COP15 that's yeah. going on right now is all about, is, is the, the, the dying off of diversity, of species diversity, right? So, uh, you know, how many species do we actually need until we just have destroyed enough yeah, yeah. of the ecosystem, so there's no way that it, it can ever rebuild itself again. I'd say we're already past that. Part. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it'll obviously, the sooner humans go, the bigger the gene pool. Surviving uh, gene pool. Will be. Uh, yeah, and, and every day we uh, we're walking this planet. The gene pool is decreasing. All right. Let's see. Um, I like your, que your questions and comments. Thank you to everybody in the chat. I am reading this. People are freezing in Sweden as electric costs soar, says Fred, Fred Bunter. Um, yeah, you know what's so weird about um, collapse, right, about the collapse of the planet, is that we have these incredible cold spells, right? So, so the point is that there's this gradient of temperatures between the uh, equator and the, the North Pole, and uh, and the Arctic is heating, you know, four or five times as fast as the rest of the planet. So this part of the planet's heating, this part of the planet's not heating as fast. So it's that differential that allows the um, the polar jet stream, right, the, the polar vortex to sort of form over the North Pole. So when that differential uh, uh, decreases, then what happens is that vortex suddenly is not stable up there anymore, no, right? And it starts diving down. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, you have six degrees in Syracuse, and you have record cold, right? And then you have record heat like we're going to experience here in uh, in California. I hope starting there. tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's <laughs> going to be record heat, right? So, so you know, the, these people who are, are totally ignorant of this stuff think, oh, it's so cold. How, you know, you're saying it's going to be global warming, and it's so cold. But, I mean, that is exactly what what's happening. This is exactly what's predicted, this kind of stuff. Well, Sweden in December is not exactly no. a tropical beat. No, it? you wouldn't I've never, I've, been, I've never been to Sweden. No, but you never will be. Yeah, you wouldn't expect it to be uh, warm up there on a good day. All right. Um, so let's see. I think, you know, we've been going about an hour, 15. Maybe we'll yeah. just take a couple more questions. Two more questions, and we got to wrap it up. we got to wrap it up. Um, oh, Two thank more. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. For, oh, by the way, we've got to mention before we go out, there is a friend of ours who's having a show tonight, right? Is Sandy having a show tonight? Sandy, where is Sandy Shellis on here? She you know, we, we had to reboot the thing, so she probably got lost. We, we probably, probably lost we probably people out of chat that we should have. We had. hear enough from Sandy. We love her. We're, yeah, she's coming on at 9 o'clock Central. 9 o'clock so Eastern. Eastern. So what's her channel? Environmental Coffee House. So, so go visit Sandy. Um, and if you want in chat, mention us, you know, say we sent you because, you know, that way we'll get bonus points. Um, and, and it's all, you know, for us, it's all about um, 
uh, bonus points. Okay, two more questions. I just have to read this Bella Lagrisi right. comment, God creating war so that Americans would learn geography. Uh, God, I love that comment. <laughs> um, I, I bet three-fourths of Americans couldn't point out Libya on a damn map. All right. Um, all right. <laughs> uh, question, so, so you asked two more questions. Okay. Two more. This is the second to the last question. The that, penultimate question is... I, you can deny... We can skip this question if you do want, don't to want to count it. it. No, I'm going to tell oh, you. Okay, this is one I have to read. Can Elon Musk oh, single-handedly solve the underpopulation crisis? Uh, he's doing a damn... He's up to... What, how many do we know about? I think we're 10 now. Yeah, wait, that we know about. He's, he's got, uh, my, my guess uh, is twice that many. He's, yeah. he's doing a, a, a... Well, he told him... He says that he wants to hold himself up as an example. Yeah, of, yeah. Of, uh, of how, we all, uh, how we should all have 10 kids. Uh, Nick uh, asked me the question, Elliot, seven or eight pick game on electronic keynote. Nick, I have a website uh, I'd like to invite you to visit. It is advancedadvantageplay.com. So I spent three and a half years essentially uh, figuring out how to beat every casino game, uh, doing mathematical analysis, computer analysis, and figuring out every way under the sun. Um, I have this particular book right here. Let me just show this to you. See how thick that book is? So this is my book on how to, and I like that it's a green cover so you can see the copper mine, you know, behind it. <laughs> so this is my book on advantage on, on beating casinos. And to screw at Amazon, to screw with Amazon, I sell this, look how thick this book is. I sell this book for $12.95 on Amazon. I make, I make almost nothing on it. I don't care. Um, but that will answer your question about electronic Kino. Um, if you right. if you really care, visit my website. Okay, yeah, uh... And uh, let's just see if there's one more serious question that we guys can answer. All right, somebody asked us a serious question so that we can finish on that. Um, given that, oh, I want you to answer this one. This one's good. Okay. By Sat12, we don't have a question yet. No, I... I... Do you know no, Sat12? No, I, I, I have nothing to say to you, brother. Get off of this channel. Oh. Get oh. off of here. Get out of here. All Don't right. you ever show up here again. All right. All right. <laughs> I'm gonna... This is why we need a moderator. All right. That guy is a scumbag. I want him gone. I, uh, I... Get rid of him. He is sick, twisted poison. Oh, look where we are. Anyway, where next where question. Next question. <laughs> All right, Sam. Tell us what you really uh, think about uh, this person. Uh, anyway. Yeah, Next, yeah, we we we've been so it, it's been so nice to have this chat <laughs> without right. that asshole. Well, I I did here, not know. Uh, stinking, this, stinking uh, I chat didn't bite. know that. All right. Anyway, next question. Next question. All right, our final question yeah. tonight. What is in our glass? I want you to talk uh, about it, about exactly oh, okay. everything you put into our glass from start to finish. I, I, I will gladly. I'm the one who made these margaritas. All right. And I was in there making the margaritas, and he said, Sam, make mine stronger than yours. So this man has had twice as much alcohol since we started this. And I'm only, I'm barely halfway through half as much alcohol as this man. Just so these people who think Californians, we can drink. We know this this, 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 this uh, hilarious myth that Sam Mitchell is, sits there and just gets shit faced drunk on a tequila. And, you don't. Now I mean, that you've known me for three yeah, days. no, you don't. You are not. You. I got to tell you, this guy he, he doesn't do drugs. He doesn't. You know, just his alcohol consumption. It sounds it, like it, his it, margaritas it, are uh, strong. He makes weak. I love weak pansy weak margaritas. margaritas. I. Uh, it, it, it's embarrassing what it is. But tell them, tell them the actual ingredients. In the okay. Market. The way my margarita is made is, well, okay, it would be one part tequila. And people, I, this is Exotico tequila. The most important thing with tequila is that it's 100% blue agave. And then so one part tequila, then half a part of orange liqueur. Now we're just using the this triple sec. I mean, obviously you want uh, Cointreau or Grand Marnier if you got the money for it. So one part, 100% agave tequila, one half part. So I would do one shot of the 100% agave tequila, a uh, half a shot of whatever the orange liqueur of your budget and three shots of what I use is simply limeade. 
Uh, it is it is one half the price of any of the uh, of the margarita mixes. Uh, this what what I is called simply limeade. Now a few people think my margaritas are too sweet, so they do sweeten. And then you, you take, uh, but you can take the more actual lime you put in, you know, brings down the, uh, the sweetness of the Simply Lime. But that's my, that's my uh, margarita. A, a delicious margarita. I, you know, I, I have enjoyed, normally I drink whiskey and Coke, you know, and I've just been drinking nothing than, other than margaritas. Uh, I want to say thank you. Mm. Look, these questions have been great. And I, there's a lot of questions I can see up there. Butterfly, uh, butterfly wings. I wish I, I had time to answer uh. your question. Martin, uh, we're, uh, we're done. You know, yeah, we are. Uh, Adam McPherson, <laughs> I don't know what your last name is, but thank you for whoever you are. <laughs> I appreciate for that. Uh, and everybody else who has... Uh, contributed questions yeah. here. I just think this has gone great. And uh, we love you, you guys. Know, so, so Except th Sat 12. Hey, uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> All right, everybody. We'll, we're going to see you later. So we'll see you later here and catch you next time. Bye-bye.